but there are several, several BYU professors that were involved, for example, in the protests, rallying up and getting people going for the protests at BYU that didn't just end up at BYU, they ended up in Salt Lake at the headquarters protesting against the church. So since I began talking about the infiltration of the hard left, I'm talking about liberals, I'm talking about the hard left at BYU, I've had several professors contact me and message me uh, on both sides of the aisle, by the way, right? I've got some that are very supportive of what I'm doing and, and others who are uh, not so happy with what I'm doing. But I received a recent message from a BYU professor since Elder Holland's talk. And I want you to clearly see, we're, we're going to break this out a little bit here, uh, what we're up against And it's not just BYU. I want to make this very clear. Why do I care about BYU? Well, yes, uh, my almost my entire family is is our alumni from from BYU. But it's much more than that. And I'm a huge sports fan of BYU. But but it's much much more than that because this is where it starts, and then it can move out into the church. That is my greater concern, right? I want to defend the church, and I see this as a a very pernicious threat to the church. So this professor messages me against uh, a certain interview that I did uh, previously about the differences between the left and the right and going into political philosophy and, and a number of different things. And his message is very informative as to what the church is going to be up against. Here's how it starts out. He says, first of all, about your straw man misrepresentation of the left. I disagree. There were no examples given for that. Um, It's not all anti-family, nor is it all secular. Well, I appreciate that. I'm glad that he's at least clear about that, that some of the left, and I'm talking about the hard left, right? We, We must distinguish between what I'm usually talking about here is not the libs, right? It's not the liberals for, for you that are conservatives who are have grown up used to this kind of battle between the conservatives and the liberals. That is not what this is. This is the hard left that we are dealing with now. These are the radicals. This is very different. And in fact, you would hope that many of the liberals, true classical liberals, would fight against this. Many do. And and you need to keep that in mind. But I'm going to circle back around to this about being anti-family and secular. There's a third component that's very important with the hard left. Yes, it's highly secular, uh, so anti-religious. Yes, it's anti-family, very anti-family. But third, it is anti-liberal democracy. So those three things, it's against liberal democracy, it's against the West, therefore, it is against the family, and it's against religion. And yet, here's what you get. This, this, you know, even if this professor uh, doesn't lean hard left, he's still willing to support and approve of things that are going on in the hard left. It seems like he's approving of the hard left, however. So in this interview, I had gone through with a another BYU professor, and we had talked about the DNA of the left and the DNA of the right as well, right? And and where this this political philosophy over the centuries has now brought us to a left versus right dynamic in especially the United States. And so I had mentioned several uh, philosophers and, and, and political figures in regards to that DNA. And here's what he says. The real DNA of social justice, he's using the term social justice, traces directly past Marcuse, a Marxist from the Frankfurt School, Hegel, Kant. Hegel gives us dialectic. Kant gives us critique. These are very negative, critical approaches to life. It's, it's all part, really, you could say, of a nihilism to some degree. And he, goes, he says that DNA goes far prior to that. To where? to the prophets and Jesus. 
So this is really important to understand. I have told you before that social justice or critical social justice, it's better defined as critical social justice because it's, it's seeped in, in critical theories, which are neo-Marxist theories. And then you can add in race and intersectionality and a, a heavy dose now of postmodernism also. But this hard left ideology and worldview is a religion. And here, a member of the church is going as far as to say that Jesus, you can trace back social justice to Jesus. Now, when we talk about social justice, it used to be before the radicals took, took over the term that everybody probably wanted, most everybody wants, wanted and wants social justice. We don't want a specific group being sidelined. Nobody wants that. Everybody wants opportunity. That's very different from what I'm going to get to in a minute, which is equity, which is a forced outcome for all. But moving this DNA all the way to the prophets and to Jesus is preposterous. It, it, it reeks of liberation theology, that Jesus is a political figure more than a savior, more than a healer. That's what liberation theology is all about. Now, I'm not saying that's exactly what this professor is saying, but certainly it is a big step toward that. Jesus was a social justice warrior is what he's saying. He was the social justice warrior. And it's very important to be able to parse that out and understand that there is a huge difference between I'm going to help the poor, I'm going to help people that are marginalized, which we all need to do. We all need to be full of charity. A lot of, a lot of American libertarianism, for example, is completely bankrupt of that. And that is part on the right. That is, it's, it's completely bankrupt of um, I, we need to give and help others. And that's why these pernicious ideologies arise, by the way. But this is very similar to James Cone or Skinner or, or those that kind of brought about liberation theology in some of the uh, Jesuit Catholic traditions, especially Latin America, that were really focused on lib liberation theology, which was all about putting Jesus up as a social justice warrior, literally, over the oppressors. That's the focus of liberation theology. And it's a very important thing to get because... It's already entering into the, 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 the Catholic religion. It's entering into uh, very much where you never used to see it before, before the 60s and 70s. It's entering into Protestantism in the United States pretty strongly. Just watch what's happening with the Southern Baptist Convention. So here you have a BYU professor post Elder Holland's talk as if that's going to make any difference. I hate not pulling anything away from Elder Holland. I'm just saying these ideologies run very, very deep. And he's saying that social justice, as we know it today, that's what he's saying, a hard left movement that is completely against liberal democracy, that yes, in many cases, is anti-family and is very rooted in secularism. Jesus was not a critical theorist. Jesus was not a Marxist or a neo-Marxist. He did not believe in a worldview of force to change things. Again, what I usually use as an example is think about 1917 Russia before the October Revolution, right? And, and you're, you're talking with someone and, and that person is a hardcore communist looking for revolution. And they say to you, Hey, we need to using something like social justice. We're 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 going to change everything. We need to, we need this create greater idea of this utopian civilization, and it's all about helping the poor, right? It's all about social justice. But look at everything that comes along with that. It's the ideology, it is the praxis, the activism. It is a new world view. And then, like many professors will do, and, and by the way, there's, uh, there's an important recent talk by Jeffrey Thane. 
I don't remember the name of it. It was at the recent fair conference here at the beginning of August. This is 2021. And he spoke about these worldviews, these different worldviews, how you can have two different people who study the same scriptures but have a completely different view. And of course, as, as Joseph Smith said, that's why you have living prophets to help you interpret and understand what is going on and what the, what the, uh, uh, what the scriptures mean. But there are several, several BYU professors that were involved, for example, in the protests, rallying up and getting people going for the protests at BYU that didn't just end up at BYU. They ended up in Salt Lake at the headquarters protesting against the church. And part of it, as you conflate the ideas of social justice, a hard left social justice, and the life of Jesus and his mission, well, what do you get? You get a completely new worldview of Latter-day Saint doctrine and scripture. And that is being taught at BYU. He goes on and gives the example found in the New Testament that the more you condemn the world, the more you have lost him, being Christ, who came not to condemn the world, but to save it because he loved, he so loved it. This is the same idea of, of a teddy bear Jesus. Everything is okay. Everything is comfort. Everything is tolerable. Everything is all right. There is no judgment. There's no condemnation. It's all grace and feel-good love from a teddy bear Jesus. That is being taught. That I have firsthand accounts of, of that type of, of teaching at BYU. And this professor falls right in line with that. And he brings up also the oppressed. Again, this is about a political savior. He's redefining. It's not that Jesus wasn't political. Of course he was political. Inevitably, he was political. I mean, theology, or it was a theocracy within Jerusalem under, of course, the Romans. So, so of course, his doctrine even is going to be political. But that's not his purpose. That's not what his primary mission is. And so the professor goes on and says, he wants less separation, this is Jesus, and more engagement. I, I, less separation from what? I mean, if there are certain commandments, does he, does he want to reduce the commandment level so that more people are, are not separated? It, it's, it's such a strange attitude toward the gospel. He wants less separation, uh, the professor says, and more engagement. I, uh, the engagement for sure. Not defending one institution, but helping the oppressed. <laughs> okay. That's what he wants. That's what Jesus is about, is just helping the oppressed. And it's a political issue. And look, he is for the oppressed. He's, you know, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek. He is for those that are marginalized. He wants to help them. He sits down with the sinners. But you can see in his language the focus on what he sees as a political mission of Jesus. And again, I bring you the example of a Jewish Messiah. Not Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. I'm talking about what the Jews believe in. What do they believe in? They do not believe in a divine figure. And I'm not saying that of this professor. I, I, I would believe that this professor believes in a divine figure. But it moves us closer and closer to this idea of what, if you look carefully, what King Noah and his priests believed. And likely what the Nehorites believed, at least to some degree. A political Messiah that will come and save us and overthrow all of the oppressors. Isn't it interesting how history continues to repeat itself? The same psychology of individuals, the same power dynamics, the same fight against the true doctrine of Christ. But see, I could use the same example on the right that he's using here about the oppressed. Yeah, Jesus was for the oppressed. Of course he was. Wanted to help them out. How you do that is, is the big question. I'm pretty sure he was about charity, not about hard leftist ideologies. But I can use the right as an example also. What did he want? He wanted everyone to become one. He wanted Zion. 
a Zion people and, and look at the intercessory prayer in John 17 and bringing his disciples in to become one like he and the Father are one, right? So nationalistic. It's a Zion people. It's, it's, the, it's Israel. The tribes of Israel all brought together and gathered together. So, so if a white nationalist were to use Jesus and interpret it in the same way that he wants a Zion, he wants a nationalistic, exclusive, uh, uh, tribal group of people to follow him. Well, isn't that what Jesus was about? He was a nationalist. You can see how ridiculous that is. Now he goes on and says, you advocate exactly the hiring you lament. This is at BYU. When you say we have to hire more people like yourself. I'm not sure. I, I don't think that was me. I think that was who I was interviewing. But I don't think that he actually said that either. But this is a very common thing to say when you have a minority group of ideological people on the left at BYU, then of course they're going to say, you, you're just hiring more people like yourself. We need more diversity of thought is what they're going to say. Of course, at every other university where the hard left has already taken over, that's the last thing they want is more diversity of thought. Once they are the majority, then they're going to push everybody else out. And then the professor talks directly to me and says, Greg, you also rely far too much on attempting to scare people with vocabulary which they, and it appears you, don't understand as if unfamiliar must mean bad. He calls this an anti-intellectual approach. So I can say directly, if this professor listens to this episode, I'm very familiar with this vocabulary. I, I have great context to these things because I've read the leading leftist authors that are behind Professor Your Social Justice. So it has nothing to do with not being familiar with them. Quite the contrary, the fear that I have is because I know what they are and I know what comes with them. Language is important and it, it, it's important because as it enters, as a lot of this academic language of social justice, and where, where many of us still would probably need a dictionary, a, a woke dictionary to actually understand every, all of these words because they're mostly have mostly been used for several decades now in the academy. Well, now they're coming out into culture, into the culture, into pop culture. And so I find it rather elitist to say that, well, you're just unfamiliar with them, therefore you fear them. Because, hey, we're not in academia, but you are. These are all words of a hard leftist movement. And they are brought through that DNA of many of those political philosophers, literary critics, etc., that have used them, and they've been adopted into the academy in a hard, radical left movement. The professor goes on and teaches me a little bit more here and tells me that I have a serious misunderstanding of the word equity. And then the professor gives us the apparent definition of equity and says equity is a legal term in common law allowing for exactly the kind of judgment you seek namely allowing reason and mercy to moderate street strict legalism this is a falsehood this is a tiny little slice a connotation at best of how the word equity is used and all you have to do is go straight to the sources. Go and read Ibram Kendi. Read Robin D'Angelo. Read Angela Davis or Henry Giraud. And the list goes on and on and on how these academic leftists use the term equity. It is almost always framed, not always, but almost always framed against, guess what? against liberal democracy. That's why they hate liberal democracy, because they want equity, a forced equality of outcome. That is why they decry uh, meritocracy. 
That is why they decry working hard. So you can see what Elder Holland is up against. You can see what BYU is up against. And you can say, well, we just need to fire everybody that, uh, that d- believes this or this or this. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to go through McCarthyism? I'm not going to do that. As you notice, I'm not bringing up this professor's name, and I'm not going to do that. If this professor wants to come out publicly and go through these things, great. Then I will, I will address that person's name. But I'm not into McCarthyism, and it's not going to help anybody to do that. So if you're going to put that in your comments on this, just you don't even need to to start with. I'm not going to do it. This is not a battle between people. This is a battle between ideologies and worldviews. But you can see that as I've gone through these things with BYU for several months, if, if you were not sure if I was really saying this or, wow, this is hyperbole, certainly Elder Holland's talk brings some credibility to, to the things we've been talking about. And, and I can say these things because they're not a guess. I'm not guessing at these things. Again, this professor is a direct source. This professor can use their own words. And I receive several letters that are sent to the brethren on behalf of parents and what has happened to their kids. And I get direct messages from students and professors and staff, which, sure, I'm sure there's a, a, a certain percentage of them that are hyperbole, that are, that are put out of context. In fact, I know that's true. But the majority are, are real. And here's the thing. 40% of Americans ages 18 to 24 have gone to college. And if this is happening at BYU, how do you th- what do you think is happening everywhere else? So over the last 10 years especially, and 20 to some degree, a, a, a good portion of the students have been indoctrinated to one degree or another into critical social justice. And they go out into their jobs and they bring it there. Well, where else are the members of the church that have been indoctrinated into a, a postmodern critical theory, uh, a critical social justice, going to bring that? Well, the other place that I receive those messages that I haven't talked much about yet is in church. It's on the, at the podium in your sacrament meeting talk. It's in your elders quorum and your Relief Society classes. It's in your Sunday school classes. It's in the youth Sunday school classes. This will not die down anytime soon. And, and if you watch what's happening with the Church of England and the Anglicans and, and the Southern Baptist Convention, they're just ahead of us right now. Right? That, that we are going to, we're going to follow the same path to some degree. Now, it's harder with us. We have a strong hierarchical structure in the church. We have... Uh, I believe brethren and sisters that are that are inspired and receive guidance and have a certain mantle to follow through with. Thus, we see the talk from Elder Holland last week. But that doesn't mean it's not going to come to your ward. And I, I'm not throwing a scare tactic out there. What I'm trying to do is educate you and warn you so that when this comes around, you don't think it's some, you know, beautiful Trojan horse and let it into your walls. The packaging can be very nice, but what's inside is pernicious. Elder Oaks specifically goes over that in his address in October 2020 to BYU. To parse out charity from bad ideologies. But the kids are being seduced into this. So BYU has a, well, they're in a conundrum. I I don't know. I I, I am hoping for the best. I am hoping that this gets taken care of one way or the other. But when you see this and you know that it is, this is the opinion of many, many, many uh, employees, professors especially, at BYU, I, I don't know the solution. I don't know where this goes. I'll talk to you next time.